Because the Normandy region is large and the day is complex, we decided to split up to explore important sites for each country. Starting off the investigation is Michael in the town of St. Mary Glees. We begin our story with the pre-dawn invasion by American and British paratroopers. Their mission, to capture roads and bridges on the eastern and western flanks of the beaches to prevent German reinforcements from moving into the area. Over 9,000 C-47 Skytrains towing gliders and carrying more than 13,000 paratroopers from the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, the British 6th Airborne Division, and the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion took off from various bases in southern England and crossed the channel, dropping forces behind enemy lines in the wee hours of the morning. The 82nd Airborne Division dropped in and around the village of St. Mary Iglis. With me is Magalie Millet from the Airborne Museum to talk a little bit about what happened that day. So, did everything go to plan for the Allies that day? Not exactly, for the power troopers, not exactly, because, you know, it was a very bad weather for D-Day, and um, here, especially, we have uh, marshlands, and the German uh, flooded all the marshlands, so it was very difficult for the power troopers to, uh, to jump, and some of them were drawn in the marshlands. So, many power troopers were scattered everywhere, uh, around St. Marie-Église, St. Marie-Dumont. And sometimes they were, they were dropped maybe 20 or 30 kilometers from here. So it was not exactly the plan. Wow. What's with the church in the background, especially the paratrooper hanging off the side of it? Um, this, this man, this American 82nd Airborne paratrooper, the name of this man is John Steele. And John Steele is, was in um, in the stick that jumped over St. Mary Glees. And John Steele were, um, received a bullet in his feet, in his foot, doing his, um, his jump, and he was not able to control his parachute. So he was anchored on the chair steeple. And at that time, you always have German troops in the steeple because it's a good point to observe what happened. So you have two Germans in the steeple and the German took John Steele with them. He was their prisoner for three days and fortunately after that he, he was able to escape. Wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> so overall, were the Allied paratroopers successful? Yes. We, we are used to say that um, Utah Beach is a successful landing thanks to the power troopers because they complete all the objective. They gain control onto St. Mary Glees, they gain control on Lafayette Bridge, and also they were able to secure the exits of Utah Beach, so to secure the landings. So thanks to them, it was a success at Utah Beach. Wow. Well, thank you, Megalie. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So now we're going to go to a place where we can see both Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. I'm standing here at Point du Hoc, a prominent observation point between Omaha and Utah Beach. At approximately 0630 hours, the first American troops landed on Omaha Beach, the most heavily defended by German forces. Surrounded by steep elevation, the attacking Americans faced intense German opposition. In order to get off the beach and push further ahead, the Americans had to capture narrow beach exits or causeways that led inland to the Norman countryside. This site earned the name Bloody Omaha, as roughly half of the Allied casualties occurred on this one beach on June 6. Some men didn't even make it to the beach itself. A combination of rising tides and scared young Higgins boat pilots caused many of the infantry to be dropped far offshore. The men had to wade through the water with packs weighing anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds on their back. Despite initial confusion and an extreme loss of life, a small number of units managed to knock out German defenses secure the beach exits, and move inland. 
Point to Hawk was believed to be a German stronghold. Allied intelligence suggested that this was a location for the German gun emplacements that would threaten the Allied beaches and had to be destroyed. Here, you can see signs of heavy Allied bombardment. Huge craters decorate this landscape. The American 2nd Ranger Battalion landed here, scaled these 100-foot cliffs, but didn't initially find the German weaponry. They moved further inland, discovered the transported artillery pieces, and destroyed them. Further to the west of me is Utah Beach, taken by the 4th Infantry Division. Not in the original plans for D-Day, it was a late addition for its proximity to the port city of Cherbourg. The force landed further east from original plans, but the defensive fire was light. Once troops advanced further inland, they were slowed down by flooding, but eventually met up with members of the 101st Airborne by nightfall. Now let's check in with Lucy to see what was going on with the British on June 6th. I'm standing here at the beautiful lookout of Aumange Le Bon, and to my right is Gull Beach, which was assigned to the British 50th Division. Landing at 7.25 in the morning, this beach and the surrounding towns were captured quickly by the British after a short, sharp fight. Some fighting continued along the area behind the beach until morning, with roughly a thousand British casualties. German forces had been holed up in housing along the coast, which was heavily damaged or destroyed by naval gunfire. The Long Siemer Battery, where we were earlier, served as a German observation post for Gold Beach, but its guns had also been put out of commission by British bombardment from the sea. In the distance, you can see the remains of Mulberry Harbour, which, like another harbour on Omaha Beach, turned this coastline into a temporary port during the war. On D-Day, British troops deliberately didn't land here so that they could keep this beach clear. The pieces of the harbour were tugged over from England and put in place at Aramange. What we see remaining are the landing pontoons and floating roadways that could bring supplies and equipment to the beaches and then further inland to support the ground campaign. In the five months this harbour was used, 500,000 vehicles and 4 million tonnes of supplies, along with 2.5 million men, reached the Normandy region. It was crucial to the success of the invasion. Further east is the second British landing spot, codenamed Sword. The mission of the British 3rd Division that day, meet up with the British paratroopers and take the city of Caen. The forces moved inwards relatively quickly, linked up with the paratroopers but faced stiff resistance by German tankers. Although still a success, by the end of the day, Allied forces were still five miles from Caen. Now let's toss it to Wiley, who's exploring Judo Beach. Behind me is Juno Beach. The original codename for this beach was Jelly, as in jellyfish, swordfish, and goldfish. However, the planners didn't think that that was a serious enough name for such an important operation, so they changed it to Juno. Right now, we're at the Juno Beach Center. This museum commemorates the role that Canada played during the Second World War, especially for those that were killed in the Battle of Normandy and D-Day. Right now, we're steps from Juno Beach itself, where 359 Canadians died on June 6, 1944. With me is Alicia Dottawali from the Juno Beach Center. Hi Alicia, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. My so I was just wondering if you could walk us through what exactly happened here 75 years ago and what kinds of challenges the Canadian troops faced? Absolutely. So the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division stormed Juneau Beach at about 7.55 in the morning of D-Day. So that was about 10 minutes past H hour. And the troops were supported by the tanks from the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade, as well as the artillery and other units attached to the division. And because low tide had already passed, um, some of the German beach obstacles were already partially submerged under the water. This created an incredibly dangerous situation for the incoming landing craft, as there, were no, there was no telling as to where the obstacles were located as they were partially already covered. Um, as a result, about 30% of the landing craft were either partially damaged or completely destroyed even before they arrived onto the beach. And were the Canadian troops successful? Despite heavy losses in the first wave, um, the Canadians persevered and they captured the bridgehead and as well as a few of the surrounding villages. 
and the Canadians were able to link up with the British troops at Gold Beach, and, but they were still a few miles away from those at Sword. But it's also worth noting that the Canadians advanced farther inland than any other troops on D-Day. Wow, that's an amazing story. Thank you very much. D-Day is an excellent example of how sacrifice, bravery, and teamwork can turn the tide of a war. Many nations, along with the intelligence and cooperation of the French resistance, paved the way for an entire army to be brought to shore in one day, never to be dislodged. We began to see uh, the uh, anti-aircraft uh, guns, Then we were waiting for the green light, and, uh, and we saw the pasture land passing underneath us. It just, uh, it appeared like uh, a, a very uh, peaceful, uh, uh, pastoral uh, uh, area below us. Little did we know that the land that we were approaching was absolutely underwater. When we got the green light, went out, we were flying at a very low level, at least my plane was, and uh, I went out and got about one full oscillation of my, uh, par after opening of my parachute, and I hit the water and went under. And this was a great surprise to me because uh, I thought I was going to be landing in a pasture land. When our ramp went down, the signal for every machine gun on that beach to open up on the exit to our ship. So Harold Donaldson, the lieutenant, was gunned down in the boat, like you see in Saving Private Ryan. The fellow in front of me, Clarice Riggs, was machine gunned on the ramp. I dove in behind him. Only my left side of my helmet was creased by a bullet. I hit the sand behind the hedgehog, which is about 130 yards from the seawall. And uh, I observed to my right, uh, Private Robert Dittmar, Fairfield, Connecticut. I was yelling, uh, lay, he tripped over the hedgehog, spun completely around, lying on his back and yelling, I'm hit, I'm hit, mom, mother, and then he was silent. Just a short time after that, a man crawled up on my right side and uh, I saw what he was doing. He had a Bangalore in two sections, and he was putting it under the barbed wire, and uh, which he managed to do, pull the fuse on it to light the primer, backed up a little bit, and I braced myself for the Bangalore to go off, and it didn't go off. He crawled back up and removed that bad lighter, put a new one in it, pulled the string on it, started to back up, and at that second he was hit, and his eyes looked directly at, at, into mine. And, uh, and uh, with a, the look in, the, in his eyes as he died was uh, uh, a questioning look, or a puzzling look. It's hard to describe. And then his eyes just closed. Uh, uh, to me, that man was the greatest hero on that beach because that Bangalore went off, and when it went off, I was up and through that wire. 